Hey guys, welcome back. BDC Care here. We're back with Season 6, Episode 44 of our weekly P and Q and C and A and T videos, which is a very long and self-indulgent way of basically saying a Q&A, but the P is there because this exists in podcast format, which you can check by clicking on the links in the description on all the major podcasting platforms, and that is in large part due to our patrons, as you like to say. And our, well, that we have a Patreon even. That's true. P's, the, all P's. That's the P's. Uh, Q's for questions, which ties in with the A for answers, but we also have C's for comments, because sometimes people say stuff and we just want to respond to it, and they're not actually asking us a question. Mm -hmm. And T is for talking, because a lot of times we don't answer the question even when they ask one directly, uh, for most of the time we spend talking about the question. So, getting right into the questions this week, our first one comes from Flycon, uh, F -L -A -C -O -N. Is that like a French, it's Hard a French word, right? Flacon, maybe? Flacon? I don't know how... I, Hard C, soft C, there's, there's different ways to pronounce this. I don't know. Not not entirely sure. But anyways, the question that this person asks is, why you didn't up your characters to Elite 7? Okay, a flacon is a flacon, is a small stopper bottle, especially one for perfume. Okay. There we go. So that might be what it is, and it might... I, <laughs> I wonder if that's what this person's YouTube name is. Uh, it's possible. Very interesting. Um... Okay, Sorry. well, why why we didn't um, bring our characters up to Elite 7 <laughs> is the question. All right, so this ties in nicely to something we were talking about last week. Yeah. About how a consideration for building your roster early on in the game has a, a potentially big impact later. Mm -hmm. And the simple answer to the question is that not every character needs to be maxed out to level 50, Elite 7, or level 60, Elite 10 unless you want to yeah and i'm gonna get into it but there's a few underlying assumptions there so but as a demonstration right because the our flashpoint team which we don't have now but i think we've got our the, our justice league team is level 50 elite five maybe mm -hmm. um it's good enough to get max battle points and uh, sure if we max them out to elite 10 level 60 they'd still be good enough to win every fight and i think we made that point specifically with this team and we used this team on a different account that where they were all uh elite 10 level, level 60. 60 we've done it yeah. before the problem is i guess there's a few one is that the higher levels and higher promotions increase health more than damage this is the not so obvious part yeah so you're playing with and against characters that have a bigger health pool relative to damage, that means longer fights because it just takes longer to work through that extra health when you've got not as much damage to make up for it. Yeah, so everybody at lower levels is basically a little bit closer to a glass cannon. And you can see that actually in the way that bronze, right? When right. you have bronze maxed out, they're much closer to equivalent health and damage stats. Oh, even more so when you use them with Apocalypse. That's true. Yeah. Not Dark Side, sorry. <laughs> This is the whole Marvel DC thing, and I want to get into this. There's an article I read uh, just a couple weeks ago about the difference between Marvel and DC, and I always get Dark Side and Apocalypse mixed up because there actually is a a Dark Side Apocalypse, isn't there? I oh yeah, there's an Apocalypse Dark Side. Yeah, yeah, and they are both sort of that kind of. I mean, Apocalypse is the new gods. He's this big sort of sort of a god. And in, in Dark Side in Marvel for the mutants is sort of like that too, where he's just really powerful and he's a mastermind behind things. Yeah, but anyways, the passive of Dark Side, uh, <coughs> with the plus three hundred percent health and attack, right? Yes, uh, shows you when they're scaled up to be approximately the level of like a like a low tier to moderate uh, gold, they are way heavier on damage than health. Right, right. Comparatively to like no natural golds. And I guess the second reason is the more obvious one for most people. It's that higher levels mean you're matched against teams that are more likely to have Astro Harness, right? Yeah, because they have better gear. Right. So there are other character and gear combinations that can make a fight last longer. But I think for a single piece of gear, Astro Harness is this, the worst for this. And I think we talk about in a lot more detail in our video on multiplayer strategy for ranking as high as fast as we can and we'll link that into the description and in the eye in top right corner mm -hmm. and um so we talk about it a lot more and we demonstrate the principle with our flashpoint team so i mean the biggest thing really is that when you're like us and you put in what hundreds of hours that that wouldn't be a, a conservative estimate right yeah um, probably thousands yeah speed becomes greater priority because if we're putting in that much time we don't want to spend a lot of time doing stuff that we don't like 
and sometimes we just want to grind and we just want to, to rank up. So, which is, I think, probably a big part of the reason why we put such an emphasis on the offensive potential of our teams. Yeah. Um, and also just because, you know, for, for literally anything you're doing, there's no advantage to doing it slower here, right? There's there's yeah. literally no time-based rewards, right? So taking longer to do <laughs> stuff. Some stuff requires you to do it faster, right? Like time limits on fights. Right. And some stuff just makes it more efficient if you do it faster. The one thing I still like about this Justice League team and why we s still do it, use it every once in a while, even though the Flashpoint team is clearly faster, is that with this team, there's definitely a lot more strategy involved. With the Flashpoint team, there's one basic strategy. You don't really need to deviate it from, from it very far. But with this Justice League team, there's certain elements that are worth, um, I guess, engaging with. So, for example, you bring a player to or an opponent to low health and you need to tag out Wonder Woman, who should you tag in? Now that we've got Necron Scythe on Superman, yeah. it's worth tagging him in because then he can get the benefit of the revive and it, it he basically becomes another meat shield just like um, Aquaman with his Astro Harness. That's true. So I should say actually because what I meant is that there's no tangible mechanical advantage right. to doing things slower. But there is sometimes the advantage of having a <laughs> different team that's more entertaining or interesting to play with. So right. that is actually uh, an example, a perfect right. example of where I'm wrong because my language was not... Well, I, just, I don't know about wrong, just less precise. Because here's the thing, what I love about this team is if we face somebody with Astro Hearts in the first slot, then yeah, I love it because... Instead of it being a drag to slow us down, which we're committed to playing a little bit longer anyways. We're banking we're the, up power. We're powering up everybody. And you can usually get at least two bars of power because the first invulnerability lasts long enough for her to do her special two. And then as the invulnerability goes, when you use your power, you don't get it back. Sometimes you can get two and a half to three bars because you do a special two. Then a special one that is still part of the invulnerability. Mm -hmm. Then you get two bars back. Then you can do a special one again. If you're unlucky, you lose it. You do another special one, and then you're done. That's two and a half bars for your teammates. Mm -hmm. I think. Is that right? Um, yeah, two and a half bars. That's yeah. right. We did five times, five bars. But then if you're really lucky on the the fourth special, which is another a second special one, you bring them down to their next year vulnerability. Then you get a few more special ones off, and you get a full three bars of power. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So here's that, that sort of tension and the, the, the push and pull in the early game between uh, making progress uh, faster to increase the level and promotion of your cards versus the later game where getting augmentations and getting good gear is really important for winning in multiplayer because late game, I think, multiplayer becomes a, a bigger draw. It's, well, yeah, because the actual amount of content in the single player game is not that much. It doesn't feel like that much now. It's it's for how long comparatively. It's been, yeah. If you look at the percentage of time that we spent playing single player versus uh, multiplayer in any sort of meaningful sense, yeah. multiplayer easily eclipses single player. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I, again, I guess it comes down to where you're at with this game. Whether you're here for the short term, uh, for the long term, or us where we're it's not even long term anymore. It's just we're. We're like legacy player levels. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I so there's a huge temptation when you're starting out. You want to max out the cards that you have in order to get the bonuses from finishing online for finishing offline play, and you want to be able to get to bonus battle six as quickly as possible to farm power credits. Yeah, and so what's crazy about that is that. It might be faster in, in that small period of time, but if you're really committed to playing longer, what you really need is the gear, and gear takes a huge amount of time to to get and to max out. Yeah, because the amount of resources that you need uh, just to just to get your gear. The one advantage of gear is that once you have one copy of everything, you can shatter your your extra copy. So you you your resources for upgrading it have like sort of accumulate naturally in your quest for getting all the gear. Right. Right. So that and that brings us back to what we were talking about last week, right? Where there's the danger of focusing too much on the challenge pack instead of the gold pack in the early game. Yeah. Because if you promote a card high enough to farm offline, it there's a potential that it makes them less fun to play online in multiplayer. 
Yeah. Because the matchups you get make it too hard to be competitive, never mind winning. I mean, to me, I think it's like sports and stuff. In games, whatever, where you're competing against somebody, yeah. I don't mind losing. I mind feeling like I'm not competitive, like I'm being totally uh, dominated. Yeah, like that... Oh, I mean, this <laughs> is different because it's not actually in a, like an, a true online game, right? Where you're just playing against online matchups where basically when you're attacking, you can win every time if you want to, and that makes sense. And right. almost everybody can win every time when they're attacking um, w- without the system being unstable, right? right? Just because of the nature of it. But in like online games, I know that like in the long term, if you have like a win rate of like 55%, that means you're good. That's right? right. Like anything over 50% is you know, means that you're on a slow sort of tick upwards, right? Right. And and it means also that you're finding good matchups. Yeah. Because it's, you know, if you were like a, a grandmaster chess player and you kept them playing beginners yeah. at the park, it's probably not nearly satisfying and I expect your win rate to be a lot higher than 55%. That, that's true. Yeah. In an ideal system, your win rate should be right around 50%. And if you <laughs> are really on your game, you should be able to push it slightly higher than 50%, but not much higher. Right. Right. Yeah. So this is, again, same tension, right? The idea be- between collecting and maxing out your characters, which is what's implied by why are they only level 50, elite 5, why haven't we pushed them higher? Um, and it it really does. There's That that, that was funny, the, the term you used, legacy, right? Because long-term, a long-term goal is to collect everybody. Yeah. A longer-term goal is to collect everybody and max them out. Yeah. Because there's some that you can't buy directly from a store, some that aren't available in challenges you need to have enough get through enough multiplayer seasons and for most people that probably feels like forever Mm -hmm. us on the other hand we sort of gotten past that point where maxing everybody out would feel like there's the potential for an end so like once you've maxed everybody out you're seeing i mean because you can't have a totally complete collection anymore with you the can't medals, have everybody right. augmented. Well, right. Not even with the medals, even before the medals, you can't have everybody max augmented. You can't have every bronze, silver, and gold max augmented. It just doesn't make sense. Like, maybe one day, one day. I think we're it, not close to that, I, I don't th- think. I mean, we've hoarded a bunch. We still play Survivor, and we've hoarded a bunch of augmentation cards. I think it's... I don't know. It seems like it's possible, but if we're going to be thinking about the possibility of playing indefinitely, which it, it already is sort of like now, yeah. that it's actually probably better for us to make sure that our multiplayer sort of collection yeah. is playable for as long as possible. Because I guess the the qualification always has to be that they've introduced elements like the medals where it's, we're t- looking at years, if not mm-hmm. decades, to max them out. I mean, it definitely yeah. was decades before they made the changes where it took fewer uh, copies of the medal cards to promote them after the first few like it used to take 40 something copies and now it's down to 20 something ridiculous yeah it's so they've rebalanced it to make it slightly more forgiving but still in the scheme of things pretty ridiculous yeah so i mean keeping the good cards at elite five or lower gives us it maybe the potential of playing indefinitely yeah and once online support disappears and the lesson in this or the example of this would be wwe immortals which nether realm also did where they dropped uh, online support. And, I mean, you can still play. There's still the offline game. But I think for the most of the people who've been playing for a while, they finished the offline mode already. Yeah, and, there's not really <clears throat> content there. <clears throat> yeah, they, that's the only draw. So, you know, maybe if, if that ever happens, we'll uh, do whatever we want with the game. Maybe we will we'll try to max everybody out. Maybe we'll quit. I guess almost definitely we'll, we'll we, we quit. will quit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe we'll do whatever we want with the game. Maybe we'll, I mean, we've always drawn sort of the bright line between, um, hacking and cheating, right? Like hacking is a subset of cheating, which we, we, we don't endorse yeah. because of the impact it has on other people playing the game. But at oh. that point, there won't be anybody else playing the game really that's impacted by what we do. You know what it's like? There was that tweet where somebody was like, I want a different version of the Olympics where they do allow you to do drugs. And they're like, <laughs> screw it. Let's see how high a human can jump. Right? Oh, like, where it's like that's a distinction right where if it's not affecting anybody right if right. nobody's at a disadvantage relative to anybody else then it's not really an issue yeah. yeah so that's an interesting argument right i've seen that used about um any kind of uh what do you call it peds performance enhancing drugs yeah and I, from a fairness point of view it works but i guess the original principle of the olympics was supposed to be human potential right yeah like 
celebrating human excellence. Mm-hmm. And if it becomes a matter of, I mean, it has t- to some degree already because not everybody has access to the same nutrition, the same coaching, the same training, the the same expertise. Yeah, but if it comes into access to resource <laughs> question, then it just is like, but it already is that, right? It is Again, that. Yeah, that's yeah, what, it totally because, you know, rich countries have people who train to be athletes their entire lives yep. and who are able to do that. And they can just have a higher proportion of it, right? Right. Just it, it, it really is your ability to do that is, um, it there's a bottleneck in how much how many resources your your country has and how many resources the specific people who end up being athletes have. Yep. Yep. It, the 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 main difference is that to me because of the the potential dangers and the limitations of even trying to say I mean most PEDs are restricted if not illegal, right? At yeah. least to use them the way that that you'd be for training as opposed to using them to treat a medical condition, Mm -hmm. then what you're doing is you're taking these elite athletes and let's not kid ourselves. The ones that'll be be the best will still be the people who would have been good anyways, but then they're sort of uh, boosted up, promoted Mm -hmm. a little bit. And so you're, you're putting their health at risk and it seems to go right against the grain of celebrating human excellence and pushing the limits of what a human body can tolerate before it sort of crashes and burns. Yeah, I don't think it's actually a good idea for for its uh, application. But it's kind of like uh, <laughs> the difference between like MMA and then just like no holds barred like street fighting, right? Where it's like, let's see how bad you can, like let's see how far you can take this <laughs> if we remove all the rules. Right, because MMA still has rules. Yeah. Like there's, I mean, it didn't originally, I don't know if you, you were aware of like, the origins of ultimate fighter i'm not so i mean now you've got people who are well-rounded in different different uh disciplines right so they'll yeah. do a lot of cross training they will do grappling they will do striking they will do uh wrestling and so originally there was no rules you could pull people's hair you could kick them in the balls you could do whatever and now they've got rules where i guess ufc as opposed to say um Oh, there was, what was the other, was it K1? Um, I don't know. There was the one where uh, Fedor Emelianenko was the guy that was the, the heavyweight that had been undefeated for forever. What, what, uh, somebody, somebody tell us in the comments which um, uh, fighting association he was with. But UFC, in some ways, was almost softer because you couldn't kick somebody when they were down. Mm. And down means, like, I think one hand on the ground. And, yeah. I, that's enough right like knees or know. hands on the ground so you're not allowed to kick them but in that that uh, association you could tee off on them you could kick them in the head while they're down wow and you see you're not allowed uh, i think there's no hair pulling there's no gouging um there's no uh strikes to the back of the head mm. and those used to be just whatever the they were totally but they were also less skilled right it the first few fights were oh which discipline is better and so they would have people... Yeah, so if you're doing that one. now, I guess, if it was the same no holds barred, there would be people killing people. Yeah. I mean, it's come pretty close, right? They, oh, there's... Uh, it's a few months ago. I can't remember where it was, but there was a a guy who was doing uh, luchador wrestling who died in the ring. And the ref did not realize it and didn't know how to deal with it. Oh, my God. And it was captured on video. That's awful. Yeah. And I think we we've become sort of, I mean, it's almost appropriate that we're playing this, uh, doing this over the a fighting game video, but we've become almost um, desensitized to the idea that these things that we're watching are potentially lethal. They're really dangerous. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a good thing to keep in mind that it, some of this doesn't come without risk. risk. Yeah. Yeah. That's a little sobering. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> That's a weird energy to bring to this. Okay. Um, our, our next question comes from... Right, so can I just try to turn that a little bit, though? Okay. But part of the reason why I, I watch uh, MMA... I mean, if, if the refereeing and the officiating is done properly, the risk should be relatively low. There's probably more fatalities in boxing than there are in straight-up MMA. And to me, the what I, I enjoy about uh, like true mixed martial arts is that what you've got are, are people who are uh, physically at their peak. They are strong, 
Yeah. They have great endurance. They have great flexibility. They have real skills and real talent. And they are putting themselves... I mean, they're m- more literally right at the edge of performance compared to, say, um, Olympic athletes who are doing the same sort of thing. They're pushing their limits. Yeah. But it's so much more obvious in MMA. And their obvious skill is just so much more... Um, obvious like it's just self-evident it's really all all on display Mm -hmm. and you can see it there because i mean they're doing stuff that almost feels like it's not humanly possible it's one thing to say well they're doing this one movement but doing so much weight that you you can't even come close but these are people that are doing things that just aren't even possible like not even close to what's possible for me so i i do respect them a lot because of how they've really um maximized their potential yeah. So I have a lot of respect for uh, MMA fighters. Okay, cool. Uh, our next question comes from David Orasakwe. And he says, hey guys, quick question. My current multiplayer team is Batman Ninja Nightwing, Batman Ninja Lord Joker, and Batman Ninja Batman, and I lose a lot. So I was thinking of starting an Arkham team. I have Killer Croc at E7, and will do the same to Batgirl. But seeing as the next challenge might be Kandak Black Adam, I'm screwed. I was hoping for Arkham Knight Catwoman, but... Uh, and the only Arkham ca- character I have is Joker. So tips, guess it wasn't a quick question. And, uh, <laughs> I want to say first off, when I first read this, I actually had to write the names of the characters in brackets just in case, because for some reason I saw BNNW, right? Cause we're using abbreviations yeah. here. So you got well, BNNW, BNLJ and BNB. And, um, <laughs> the only thing when I saw BNNW that I could think of was Blackest Night Nunder Woman <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Nunder Woman. I mean, it's... Okay, so we're fighting a Blackest Night... Uh, sort of a two-thirds Blackest Night team. Blackest Night Batman and Blackest Night uh, Hawk Girl. So this is the problem with abbreviations, right? So BNB could be Batman Ninja Batman or Blackest Night Batman. Yeah. And so it becomes... And BNNW could be so many things. <laughs> Nun- Nunder Woman. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, context clues being what they are, you know, you think Batman Ninja, uh, Nightwing, and two Batman Ninja characters. Yeah, no, I didn't I didn't read all of them, so I was just trying to puzzle out the first one on its own. If I'd gone through the other two first, if it was in a different order, I probably would have been able to get it, but I, I saw that one, and it just stopped me on my tracks, and I'm like, what? Who's, who's NW? <laughs> Blackest Night. <laughs> and it, there's no real, I guess, standardization for this, right? Because Nightwing is one word, isn't it? Yeah, but so technically it would be N, like or in a lowercase W if you're gonna. I, so is there anybody else who has the name that starts with the N? Uh, I don't think so. Nancy. No, but in <laughs> in this game, there's lots of people whose names start with N in life. Yeah, I don't think so. So I it's guess true. I guess the N should have made things clear for you me. In? But I was trying to include the W, and. So you, but they're both capital, right? So yeah, you're thinking you're prioritizing the W, and to me, W is Wonder Woman. Yeah, exactly. Like that's double, what was, double. That's what I was thinking. It was two letters, double, and the double second w. letter was W. So I was like, oh, it's Thunder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we, I, I think whenever I go onto the forums and stuff and talk about uh, characters, because there's not the standardization, right? Because B could be um, Bane. So you've got uh, Arkham Knight. Is it Arkham Origins or Arkham? Is there an Arkham Bane? Um, there is. Arkham oh Knight God, Bane. There is Arkham yeah. Knight Bane. So you could... Arkham Knight Bane would be the same as Arkham Knight Batman. That's true. Unless you did B, lowercase m, because Batman is sort of one word, right? Yeah. Or you could do BM, like bowel movement. Batman. Can I tell a story about one of your, your teachers? Uh, you can't, because it, <laughs> it's identifying information about is your it? name. I guess it? that's true. It's just initials, but all right, I so I won't, I won't bother doing that. Yeah. But BM is bowel movement, so it's not... Uh, it's not particularly glamorous. So That's anyway, true. sorry. Whenever I get on the forums, I always like to write out the name first before I start doing the abbreviations, which is, I think, standard uh, journalistic practice. Like, that before you start using I think it's also on, like, articles when you're doing, like, scientific articles or citing sources where you start with the right. full term and then you move to abbreviation. You start with the full term, you pair full term with abbreviation, and then you move to abbreviation. Yeah, I think, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but I guess it's probably a, a higher standard that we, than we can expect of people on the forums. When And also, I think in a lot of cases, it's not necessary, because you can mostly piece together from context clues unless you um, can't get your mind off an underwoman. <laughs> I think most most of the time I'm all right. It's letters, and I go, oh yeah, that's who it is. And then sometimes I'm like, I don't, what? 
Okay, so the, maybe getting back to David's original question, yeah, is that this is probably a good example of why it's very tempting to max out characters, but it can be, it can work a little bit against you because, so David's got Killer Croc at East Elite Seven, and doesn't have Arkham Knight Batgirl there yet, so they're gonna have to do a lot more work to bring them up, and it's gonna take them a while to get there, and you probably don't need Killer Croc at Elite Seven. And if you don't bring it, but if you don't bring everybody else, his stats will be so high that your matchups will be poor and your offensive characters, because I'm assuming based on Killer Croc's passive of getting armor, that Killer Croc is going to make a really good uh, tank. Yeah. Um, and he's better. They, I buffed him a little bit in his speed, but he used to be so slow that he couldn't really get anything in. Everybody yeah. would be able to be... To, to do basic attacks while you're just trying to start yours. Mm-hmm. Um, this is also a good tie-in uh, from what we were talking about earlier where you don't necessarily want everybody at Elite 7. Uh, you definitely, definitely, uh, as sort of the most baseline principle, when there are teams with team synergies, you want to have them all at the same Elite level unless you have a special reason for putting one a little bit higher than everyone else. Or if their stats are unbalanced. Sometimes it's not so much the Elite level, but just that their stats comparable. are... comparable, that's true. ...close enough. Yeah, but so this is this is a sort of special case where it becomes extra, extra important, where you don't want to have uh, anybody with team synergy be boosted beyond everybody else. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's de- a definite danger. And I love that this team that we're watching on the screen for the benefit of... Um, we we'll describe it for the benefit of our podcast listeners. Containment Doomsday, I think he's underused. Now that he's had his breakthrough, he can be really powerful because his stat matchup, he's got effectively, uh, I guess, almost double his pool of health. It's like, wait, isn't it more than double? Because he comes I think back with 50%. 50%. 25%. Is it 25%? Each time, yeah, when he gets knocked out. And that's three times. Three so times. So he gets an extra 75%. Okay, yeah, yeah. And each time he gets a boost to his, his damage. Yeah. So he's... He's criminally underused. Um, but, all right, so there's no reason. So David mentioned that, that he, they've got the Arkham Origins Joker. There's no reason Arkham Origins Joker can't be the third Arkham character. We've done in a previous Arkham team with, I think, Arkham Knight Batgirl and Arkham Killer Croc, but with Arkham Knight Catwoman, who David doesn't have as the damage over time specialist. But there's no reason you can, and we'll link that in the description too. But there's no t- no reason why we can't um, you can't do the same for and swap out for um, Arkham Origins Joker. Arkham Origins Joker has great damage over time. It's not bleed, which we love, but he gets the extra ability from Quake Engine to delay tag out. Mm -hmm. So he gets almost the same benefit of maxing out the damage over time that um, Arkham Knight Catwoman does. Mm. But it's... So it's a funny question because we're so used to thinking about challenge characters, it's easy to overlook the Arkham cards that are available in the store. That is true. Yeah. So we'll... Arkham uh, Harley Quinn was the original one. She used to be worse than she is now. They they buffed her so that she would have her stats would be higher. And instead of just having a health boost, she also gave her Arkham teammates a chance to unblock special too. Yeah. And so, you know, she's not a great offensive force in her own right. And I guess if you wanted to make her work in that kind of team, because defensively she could... She gives you a bigger health pool. Yeah. But hurts your matchups a little bit because that health pool is taken into account with the matchups. She can be defensive because but she can her, heal everybody. Yeah, it's her second special, exactly. Right. Uh, and because her her dynamite is unblocked, the amount of damage it does is about half what it should be given her stats. So it's not good enough to finish. Although it's good for somebody like against uh, Raven mm. where you want to do enough damage to... Yeah, because it's all in one hit and it's consistently unblockable. Yeah, and what you want to do is bypass Raven's passive, right? Yeah. So, so you'd have to maybe rethink how you're going to play them because then Killer Croc, I guess, can't be that uh, defensive. Might you might have to change the gears a little bit and play him a little differently, mm-hmm. or them Killer Croc. We don't know. Yeah, um, that's true. But see, and the thing is, Arkham Knight Batgirl is great. She's like we're we're seeing a demonstration of her now, uh, on the opponent's team. But Killer Croc she, is definitely male coded, but. <laughs> 
Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, so she's, uh, Argonite Batgirl is really effective as protection for your other teammates. So you don't always want to be bringing her in with the risk of losing her before she saved her teammates. And you need someone that can do a lot of damage. Um, and her, the problem with her passive is allowing an unblocked special two, her only offensive aspect of her special two is already unblockable. So she's not helping herself. She's only helping your teammates. Mm. So it means that you've got to maybe work a little bit with Arkham, Ar Arkham Killer Croc. I want to say Arkham Knight Killer Croc, but no, that's not it. Arkham Killer Croc to get the most out of them. Yeah. The universe tags have gotten a little bit unwieldy. <laughs> yes. Well, it's the AK, right? This is the whole thing we're talking about abbreviations. To me, AK is almost always Arkham Knight, and I think Arkham Killer Croc is the only exception. That's true. Right? I'm not sure if he's the only exception. There's so many characters now. Yes. All right, and there's a lot of guys that we don't play. That's, yeah. The, and maybe we should Boss try Solomon that. Boss Solomon Grundy. Is, oh. Boss Solomon Grundy is the easiest one to come to mind that we don't play because we don't like Boss Solomon Grundy so, enough that it's... Well, yeah, what would be crazy is if... All right, so... You know how some gears have made certain characters spectacular? Like yeah. Cloak of Destiny and Necron Scythe have made the Batgirl spectacular for their special mm -hmm. ones. And the League of Assassin's Knives, because of the Splash Damage special one, makes them even better. So what would make Boss Solomon Grundy really good is if there's something that could make him invulnerable temporarily at about and more so that more than just like a few seconds for Astro Harness because you need a chance to do some real damage mm -hmm. you give him uh, Necron Scythe which boosts damage and power drains at uh, when they're really low health he's got the passive that boosts it and you need to have him there for a little bit to make it really interesting and make him useful otherwise he's still just and I mean the precedent's been set right they've, they've done stuff to make one particular character really good but I think the problem is there's not enough real effort being put into Injustice right now, right? They're just going through the motions. That's true, like. especially for such an old character that is no longer relevant, right? It yeah. seems like when they update people, it is for uh, putting them in a team with somebody else, right? right when they right. become a retroactive uh, synergy character, right, right? Right, and unless they're doing a boss series, which seems pretty unlikely... Then. That's right. What character? Like, what? What universe is Boss Solomon it? Grundy from? Yeah. I don't know. It seems like sometimes they they're from universes, and sometimes it just seems like it's the dude, right? And I think Boss Solomon Grundy is just Solomon Grundy from a universe in which Solomon Grundy is the boss. It, it's okay, <laughs> I don't know. So, so I'm I'm too far out of the comic book scene right now to know. But when I saw Boss Solomon Grundy, I thought of the Incredible Hulk, which is different universe Marvel. But Incredible Hulk had there was a whole storyline where he was intelligent and gray and he was some sort of enforcer so he's like a boss man like with the hat and everything like he was solomon grundy boss solomon grundy looks like that enforcer incredible hulk maybe i don't know all right so we we digress a little bit there's a point I was, oh the point i was gonna make was so that's arkham harley quinn but arkham origins batman he's still pretty great mm, that's true i mean he starts with two bars of power his basic attacks are fast and easy to chain unblocked he can be a great special two specialist, uh, which gives Killer Croc lots of armor uh, if you're going to still have Killer Croc as a teammate. And because he starts with two bars, he only needs Tantu Totem to give him power back. Mm. And instead of needing Master's Death Cart and Tantu Totem, you just give him Tantu Totem. You keep him out of first slot so that uh, if anybody on the other team has Mother Box, it doesn't drain you. You tag in. That gives you a third bar of power. You do a special two. You've got one bar of power left. Yeah. Then you tag out. So when you tag back in, you're ready with another special two. Mm. So I think that's actually really good. And you've, you only need one slot for Tantu Totem. You've got two other slots. If you want to make him a basic damage dealer or you want to lean into his special. Although I find that the special two kind of boosting um, gears aren't... Are a little lackluster. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of telling that Demon Blade, which is a two and a half star gear is still probably the best mm -hmm. special two booster. Although there's other things like, you know, heart of darkness boosts it and it it's power gen boosting. It has the extra effect on this when you finish the specials, but I, I still, it's, it's a bit of a toss up. I'd be just as happy with either one. And the only advantage that the power gen offers is that against a power dampening team, yeah. you still get a full bar of 
power with Master's Death Cart tagging in, but you know, if you're just using Tantu Totem, basically you've got two special twos with uh, Arkham Warriors Batman. Yeah, with very little work and setup. So you've got options. Like, there's a lot of things that you could try. Yeah. So that's, there we go. Yeah, that's the end of our questions this week, but you were going to tell me something about a game. Yeah, I, I have a re- recommendation for a game. Uh, it's Bad North Jotun Edition. Um, what, sorry? Bad what? Bad North. B-A-D-N-O-R-T-H. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if it's still free. I got it for, well, it was free on the Epic Store, but it's a quite fun game. I found myself having a ton of fun with it over the last week. It's a nice little sort of casual uh, roguelite so what, uh, what real-time style strategy game, game. So it's a real-time strategy game. They randomly generate islands, and you have to defend little houses on them uh, with your units, who can be either shield, uh, pike, or bow. And it's sort of like a little rock, paper, scissors, where there's different people who come at you. So and... when you say real-time... Okay, so sorry, because I'm still stuck, because I don't play a lot of games. Yeah. So real-time strategy means... Does that mean that you? C- it's not just turn-based? So you can just... If you can do stuff really fast, if you can click stuff really fast, you can get a lot done? It's kind of. So you control little... Uh, sets of units who are as a general rule there's a group of little nine guys and they're either the basic dude which is just a little dude with a sword and then you can sort of turn them into either a shield shield and sword dude a pike dude or a bow and arrow dude right um and you're you're moving so they're better so those those are improvements yeah those are improvements and then you can upgrade them farther but so you you basically move them around a little map as people come in on boats Mm -hmm. Uh, different unit types coming on boats and try to attack you and you position them so like bows guys for example uh obviously attack at range and will just get absolutely destroyed if anybody just runs up at them right right so you can put for example like bow guys with sword and shield guy in front of them and uh sword and shield are pretty versatile uh generally defensive and arrow enemies with arrows uh get blocked by them right as long as there's oh does that mean Plants vs. Zombies is a real-time strategy game? Uh, I'm not sure. It's a tower defense game. But it's... it's Like, the stuff that you're talking about, it makes a difference it's how so fast like... you do it. And it's not turn-based. Stuff will happen no matter what you do. If you don't do anything, you'll get screwed. And you have to do it fast. And if I plan it I well enough... I think it's not just... It might be. I I, I think technically is, it's not, though, because it's... Is tower defense a subset of real-time strategy? I don't think so because this is more based around like actually like positioning and moving units like live whereas for plants vs zombies i think the distinction is you plop them down and they're there right you can't move them around right and it's also like a sort of different but the moving doesn't define whether it's a strategy game though right i I don't know okay sorry i'm not sorry sorry, it's just it's just yeah making the connection Um, but you basically it's it's a nice little game rounds what i like about it is that rounds are really quick you can fight an island in like five minutes right pretty consistently um and it i got it for free it might still be free on the epic game store if it is you should totally grab it but i ended up liking it so much that i i like looked it up and there was a review that said it was on mobile and i actually just bought it today on mobile so mm-hmm. i got it for free and i purchased it because mobile is you know an easier format to play right a game like that so does your your progress transfer like is it no, it doesn't. Or okay. I actually, I don't think it does, but I didn't check because I'm more than happy enough to just start again on the other one because you can, you can play through it quick. Like when I was first learning, you can turn on or off the ability to restart a level. Right. Um, and so I was playing with the ability to restart levels. So I sort of, because the idea is that if, you're, if your little set of units die in your right. conflict, even if you win, you lose them permanently. Oh, so you, okay. you can get new guys as you go through and you can pick up new basically like squads. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole sort of, uh, there's a lot of like sort of secondary systems that you have to manage where everybody gets to fight once before they get fatigued. Mm -hmm. Um, and every turn, basically the idea is that you're hopping from Island to Island in sequence. Um, and the more islands you do, the more money you get, uh, to get more upgrades. But you're spreading your attention thinner. It's not that you're spreading your attention thinner. It's that when everybody gets fatigued, you, um, move on to the next turn. Right. And it refreshes all your units. And there's sort of a there's sort of a tide at the back that right. pushes forward that um, locks off islands that get pushed behind the tide. So you have to budget. You know, maybe you have one really good unit that you want to use over and over again. But if you refresh right. every turn, it means that you only get to conquer one island per turn you use, and the the tide behind you is sort of locking off the old islands, and you don't get a chance to do all the islands to get all the money. Right. So there's there like. Resource management. Yeah, resource management. And it's sort of... You, you get a hang of it really quick. I mean, the, the explanation of stuff like this is always 
makes less sense than actually just going and playing for it yourself. But I'm right. finding it quite enjoyable. It's a really fun game. There's some, uh, you know, it's a good sort of micro strategy game where it doesn't take that long. Rounds aren't that long. There's not a huge number of units to manage. There's not a lot of upgrades. So right. your your number of choices at any given moment are relatively simple. Right. But what you actually get to do ends up feeling like you're making meaningful strategy decisions, right. which is, right. it's 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 a lot of fun. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that's just a quick game recommendation of what I'm playing right now and really enjoying. All right, so it looks like we're running low on time. We've only got one more fight. So maybe instead of some of the other things I was going to bring up, I want to bring up a little project I did today. All right. So it was, um, I was, I, I don't know why I caught my eye. These key organizers, right? To So that you don't have a big jumble of keys. You can access the ones you want. I, I look at them, though, and they do make them smaller and a little bit tighter so it doesn't take up as much space. Yeah. But... I always wondered, it didn't seem like it was very easy to decide which key you want to pop out mm -hmm. and to pick the one that you want. So I saw this one other design that looked interesting where they had adhesive and magnets so you could organize your keys. They would stick together and you just sort of flick them apart. So it would be easy access. Yeah. It wouldn't take up a lot of uh, room. But the comments in the Kickstarter was, besides where is my key uh, holder, was I got them. They kind of suck. The adhesive on the magnets is not so good. Yeah. And it didn't work so great. So my project today, I w I've been scavenging all the magnets from packaging. So and a lot of them are the little earth magnets. Yeah, the ones like on like cardboard packaging that let it like hinge shut and hold without actually having like a latch. Yes. And I, I did it with my keys with super glue. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually pretty great. So we'll see because I'm sure the complaints about the adhesive did not happen after two hours of use yeah but, uh, but they also probably didn't have super glue either because they didn't want to have people sticking it having it stick on their skin and and having it go in the emergency room because they couldn't get it off yeah so there we go we'll we'll provide updates on the keys i guess <laughs> as is relevant if there's any issues yeah but there we go looks like we are all out of time for this video to finish up we'd like to give a huge thank you to everybody who is supporting us on patreon mm -hmm. that is console peasant supporting us at the highest tier last word sean farrell daniel simonson aaron mall and michael devries who support us on the credited level and eddie g and chris wolf at the gratitude level thank you so much and thanks so much to all of you for watching or listening we'll see you next time komoda, komoda.